Can you hear me? You can hear me now? Can you hear me now? Good. <laughs> Hi, nice to see you. Hi, nice to see you. Oh, it's good to see you. I'm so excited. <laughs> oh, we'll see. <laughs> it's not a typical talk. It's not theorem definition of that. <laughs> <laughs> Three more. 
Wow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I could take this down. <laughs> so uh, let's get started. Sorry for the delay, but uh, wow. <laughs> very happy about the tremendous turnout. Uh, I'm Mel Hopster. I'm chair of the Department of Mathematics for a short time longer. Um, so I'm going to say a, just a very few words about Marjorie Lee Brown, and uh, after that I will introduce Karen Smith, who is going to introduce the speaker. The speaker is not Brown's student, so I'm going to and I'm going to So I'm very happy about that. Thanks, Grandpa. <laughs> Ouch! I don't know. So, Marjorie Lee Brown was born in Tennessee in 1914 and got her undergraduate degree from Howard University in 1935. Uh, she came to the University of Michigan to do graduate work in mathematics. And at first, she could only do this during the summers because she was working full time elsewhere during the year. But she eventually earned a teaching fellowship and was able to attend full time. And she completed her dissertation in 1949 in the direction of Yuri Greinich. And she was one of the first three African American women in the United States for a doctorate in mathematics and the first at the University of Michigan. She became a faculty member at North Carolina College, which is now called North Carolina Central University, where she taught and did research for 30 years. She was head of the mathematics department there from 1951 to 1970. Uh, I've talked to that her many times, but I don't think I've ever mentioned, you know, all mathematicians are great athletes. She was, in high school, she was the women's single tennis champion. <laughs> I like to say at least one new thing. Uh, among her many achievements, she got a $60,000 grant to bring the computer to NCCU in 1960, one of the first computers in academic computing, and probably the first at a historically black school. She also established some institutes to provide continuing education in mathematics for high school teachers. And sadly, she died of a heart attack in North Carolina, in Durham, North Carolina, in 1979, very shortly after she retired. Uh, so there's a clear model here. Don't retire. <laughs> <laughs> That's my advice to you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, except this chair. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'd like to introduce Karen Smith, who will introduce the speaker. Thanks, Mel. So we've already taken a lot of Chelsea's time. We're probably getting over a little bit because of that. Mm -hmm. But i um, super happy to introduce Chelsea Walton, who is a former University of Michigan PhD student. <laughs> she is Michigan born and bred. She is from Detroit. Then she went to MSU. And then she wound up here. And only left, <laughs> only left the state. Is it a little further to? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> only left the state of Michigan when she took her first postdoctoral position at the University of Washington in Seattle. <laughs> and as that postdoc, that's like. <laughs> and from there to MIT, where she was a more instructor, which is a fancy postdoc job as well. And now she's a professor at Temple. And uh, we'll see if they can keep her there. <laughs> uh, I'm serious of her trajectory, so. I'm really glad that she's here to tell us about uh, math and the age of Trump. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's a real honor to give this talk. I mean, I, I was a grad student here, and I went to tons of these talks as a grad student. It's really interesting being on the other side of it. So I, I hope I don't disappoint. <laughs> I mean, it's a, I'm filling in some big shoes. So. Uh, let's get started. Uh, <laughs> I don't like Donald Trump. <laughs> okay. I don't like him. I don't like him. Okay, so maybe, maybe hate is too strong of a word, maybe. Okay. But I certainly loathe the guy. I mean, he, he represents everything in this country that I can't stand. 
and, and the sexism and the racism and the xenophobia that he tapped into to win to the election. I mean, I, I, I really don't need to go on, right? But I do love this country. Um, this is my home. Our food, our music, our movies, our swag. I mean, these are some of the things that I can only find in the U.S., like RuPaul and, uh, and chicken and waffles <laughs> and Prince Sour, rest in peace. And here's uh, Vegas. This is my, well, one of them's my husband. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> my aunt's here. This is my sister. I mean, I, I do really love the U.S. Now, fortunately, um, I did have the opportunity to live in a different country uh, shortly after grad school. But I, I couldn't. I mean, my friends and family are here. This, this is my home. This is my home. So this juxtaposition, um, loving the U.S., but not really loving some people here, and some practices here, this translates pretty easily uh, for me to mathematics. There are bits about this job and bits about the culture of mathematics that aren't needed. I mean, some of the snobbery. <laughs> Some of the various guises of othering, we don't really need it. Um, these practices have kept this field pretty homogeneous for hundreds of years. But I do love mathematics. I love it. It's all about discovering new truths. The objectivity, the symmetry, the elegance, the rigor, it's absolutely beautiful. I mean, it's provided me with an avenue to be creative, uh, to contribute to science and the understanding of the world. It's also provided me with an opportunity to travel and meet people from different cultures, uh, all while paying my bills. So it's, it's been a sweet kick. So it's my hope that um, more people like myself, uh, like Marjorie Lee Brown, uh, can and will uh, call mathematics home one day. Now, if you feel like I feel about Trump, you will fight him, <laughs> you will fight him and everything that he represents. And we might not see the benefits of this immediately. And that's okay, I mean, that's the way these things work. But I believe that it's just as important to take care of home. Yes, speak out against sexism and racism and othering globally, but we should also make these same efforts locally within the mathematics community. So I'll illustrate some ways this could be done and some of the immediate benefits that we can reap both professionally and personally. So this is not a standard talk that I would typically give with the theorem and example. And, you know, it's not a standard talk. Um, this grew organically out of my own personal experiences um, with conversations with friends and colleagues throughout my short academic career. Uh, I don't have too many references in this talk or a reading list or data or anything like, well, I have a little bit of data. Um, but I do know some good people who do, so if you need this information, please contact me after the talk and I can, I can give you links and such. Uh, what I would like to share today are personal stories and lessons that I've learned and some things that I'm still trying to figure out, all in the framework of reconciling this rise of Trump, this wave of pushback culture with the very, very bright future of the culture of mathematics. So even in my short time as a mathematician, I've witnessed some very positive changes. I'm very optimistic about the way things are going to go. So um, obviously, I have to talk about underrepresentation. I mean, this is kind of an, uh, an undercurrent to this talk here. So um, I'll start with the numbers. Now, I hand wrote this. I don't know if you can see. Can you see? Uh, well, OK, I have this pointer, but then I tend to, OK, maybe I'll just point, point, like point, point. OK, so this data comes from the 2015 uh, survey of recent doctoral uh, recipients from the American Mathematical Society. So in 2015, there were 880 new doctoral recipients, but I would like to point out some underrepresented groups. For instance, women make up a little bit over half of the country, but women only receive 20 7% of the new PhDs that year. So uh, there's a little bit of a gap. <laughs> there's a little bit of a gap. Now, if you go along uh, ethnicity or racial lines, as you can see, black folk make up about an eighth of the population, 13%, but we only uh, receive 2% of the PhDs. Again, a bit of a gap. <laughs> uh, 
same thing for Chicano Latinos, Hispanics, uh, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. This number is a bit of a misnomer here. Usually it's about three or four, and also American Indians and Alaskans. These are all underrepresented groups. Now, I don't have any data on uh, the number of recipients of from the LBGTQ community or disabled community, but if you have any data, I mean, please send it to me because I'm really interested on how these numbers measure up. Now, this is only at the level of PhD, like getting a fresh new PhD. If you were to take, I don't know, let's say one of these groups and look at how these numbers change uh, as you go up the academic ladder, I can only talk from the standpoint of academia, uh, the numbers bottleneck, thus the bottle. So as you see here, women made up about 27% of the PhDs in 2014, but about a fifth of the postdocs, and as you go up the ranks of academia, this number shrinks. This number shrinks. And there's the same effect for uh, people of color and different ethnicity groups, this so-called leaky pipeline. Now, there are different reasons why a particular group will leave at a particular stage. There are always various personal stories. And I'll get into some specifics later, but the common denominator from what I've seen are a lack of mentors, lack of support, inclusiveness, lack of diversity, a lack of a home, a lack of a home. So um, maybe these numbers really don't resonate with you, so maybe I should illustrate this with a picture. <laughs> so here's a recent conference that I've uh, gone to, 2015, at the Banff International Research Center. Can you find me? Can you find me? <laughs> I'm the one with the fro. Can you find me? Bam! There I am. I'm wearing the same dress. Okay. <laughs> I don't have too many clothes. So, <coughs> as you can see, ah, oh, she might not exactly fit in. But actually, <coughs> I kind of do. So here are all the collaborators that I've either written papers with or are currently writing papers with. It's about a fourth of the conference, so this feels like home. I can talk math like with over half of the people at this conference. Let's take another example, again, at the Banff International Research Center in Bath, Canada. This is in 2012. Okay, there, I'm obviously there. There's another black one. <laughs> it's two. It's two now. <laughs> of course, we're friends. Uh, and here, um, here are the collaborators um, at this conference. Now, this, this doesn't always happen. Sometimes at conferences, uh, the organizers try to bring together people from different fields to make sure, well, to somehow develop new mathematics that lie in between two fields. And this is really where all the interesting stuff uh, occurs. So, for instance, this happened at a conference uh, in 2016 in Oaxaca, Mexico. And when you bring together different research groups, well, okay, this happens, right? <laughs> but it's okay, because I, you know, I was in Mexico. <laughs> so it's fine. Actually, I really, I really learned a lot from this conference. So um, you might be wondering, I mean, particularly if you're a student, uh, how did someone like myself, uh, clearly a double minority, uh, get to this point? How did I get so many collaboration arrows? How did I even get invited to these conferences? Um, how did this happen? So two crucial notions sort of played a role in this unfolding. Uh, the notion of recruitment and also retention, okay? Throughout my career from college to grad school, postdoc, et cetera. So I, I wanna explain what happened for me in terms of recruitment and retention at each stage. Now these two ideas go hand in hand. You can't talk about retention without recruitment because you can't retain something you don't have right? You don't really want to talk about recruitment without retention, particularly for underrepresented groups, because recruitment without retention is just tokenism, and you don't want to be this guy, okay? <laughs> so we don't want to be him. <laughs> so we, we really have to talk about recruitment and retention at, um, kind of side by side. And from what I see, there are two methods for recruitment and retention on the institutional level and on the personal level, and both are equally as effective. And again, I'll illustrate this at uh, each stage of my career. So um, I won't talk about 
my experience as a tenure track professor because I'm like right up <laughs> against it and I have no perspective. And I want to skip childhood. But my dad's here. Yeah, wave your hand. Yeah. 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 I mean, I had a nice, stable, healthy child. You can ask him about it. And I don't want to talk about it. Okay, so a uh, college. <laughs> so college, 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 MSU, MSU. Um, I went to Michigan State University in 2001. Oh, that's my phone. That's bad. <laughs> and I was really, really excited about attending college. Um, it was my first choice. A lot of my friends from high school went there. And as far as, <laughs> sorry, um, it's, it was far enough from home, but it was like not too far. It was also very, very, very affordable, which is important to me. At the time, I didn't know that I could get a PhD for free by teaching. I assumed like any other postgraduate career I would have to take out loans. So going to a school that costs like, I don't know, less than $10,000 in tuition year was like really attractive. Now in terms of recruitment, MSU often visited high schools in Detroit. Like they actually came down to Detroit and went to the intercity and talked to students about um, like various scholarship opportunities, study abroad opportunities. And for me, I thought this was really cool. Like they're, they're coming down to see us. Um, so did Michigan, they came down too, and <laughs> Central and Eastern. Um, but really what got me uh, to go to MSU was that they gave me a full merit scholarship for tuition, like for four years. Again, money, I had money, 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 money on my mind because you know, I was broke. <laughs> so I also had um, other scholarships and savings that helped uh, cover my first year's housing. And I worked as an RA and I lived in subsidized housing. Anyway, I walked away from college with very little debt, which was very important to me. Now in terms of retention, I was also enrolled in the Charles Drew program at uh, Michigan State. Now this is a program for students of color and the College of Natural Sciences. Now, a lot of the students in this program go on to med school, vet school. Um, there weren't too many math majors at the time, but it was still awesome to have this community of support. All right. Um, there's a weekly freshman seminar there. I mean, it was in that seminar I heard the word mentoring for the first time. Like this was this was like groundbreaking stuff. And um, the students in the program often take classes together. Again, I was on a different track because I was a math major, but still it was really nice to be able to pretty much know the majority of, of students of color in a college of natural science by face do this program. And in fact, I heard a statistic when I was finishing that I think something like 75%, around 75% of the students of color in college of natural science were Drew students. So this was a very, very important program to me. And I was really, really fortunate to have this support in my four years there. Because it's a huge school. <laughs> I mean, it was really, really, really central. I was also very fortunate to have mentors in the department at MSU, uh, one being Dr. Jean Wald, who was here. You have to wait. Please raise your hand. <laughs> um, I took. I took like four or five classes with you. I, I, I basically stalked you. Um, <laughs> she's a non-commutative algebraist. I'm a non-commutative algebraist. Well, not at the time, but now I am. And she was a full-on mentor. Like from what classes to take, to helping me plan my next professional move, uh, to talking about finances with me, uh, to scrutinizing every guy I dated. Like <laughs> every guy, she was full-on, and, and still is. <laughs> still is. So in summary, this was a good chunk of my support system at MSU in terms of recruitment and retention on the institutional level and on the personal level here. Okay, very, four very different types of support that all played a crucial role. So I, I don't want to give the impression that it was all easy. Okay, it wasn't. Um, it was absolutely exhausted. I mean, just really, really exhausting feeling different, being the only, being on a different track in the Drew program, uh, being the only minority in math classes, being one of the few women, and actually one of the only other women in the math classes with me was Carolyn here. I mean, we took like all of our classes together. 
But like I switched my schedule so I could take classes with you and you did, when we, we, and that was my battle buddy. <laughs> so, but it was, it was really tiring being uh, different. And I remember um, this one time I was just, I was so fed up with this, like I hate not fitting in. And I went to complain to Jean and you know what she told me? I mean, we talk very, I guess, bluntly <laughs> with each other. Uh, she said, um, yeah, you're different. <laughs> you're different. You're different. You will be different. You will always be different. You won't fit in in the traditional way, but use it. Use it. You stand out. Use it. I mean, and, and this was very, very liberating in me because there was no way I could compare myself to anybody. I was automatic. I mean, eventually, I think students and, and people in this field, they need to eventually realize that they are on their own track. But that conversation made me realize that early. I am definitely on my own track. So again, I got sick of feeling different, but then I learned how to use this to my advantage, okay? So anyway, I just wanted to share a picture of Jean. <laughs> and this is her advisor, Lance Small, uh, I guess sort of my other grandpa-ish <laughs> at UCSD. So again, that community of support in college was really important. So on to grad school. I have to talk about Michigan and a little bit of debt because, uh, debt because you know, I'm here. I applied to uh, eight grad schools, uh, three fancy-ish programs, like top 10 programs, a few top 20 programs, and a few places that I heard that would be a shoe in whatever that means. Um, now, I didn't know much about grad programs at the time, so I, I applied to programs where, see, I applied where Jean went, and I applied where other mentors went. Like, I had no idea how to pick schools. I basically got advice and applied to particular schools. I also tried to pick schools that had a decent algebra group, because I wanted some choice. So I got into four programs, and Michigan was the most prestigious. And so, you know, I was pretty, pretty excited. Um, I was actually really surprised that I was admitted here. Um, I always, I always saw myself as like middle of the pack. I mean, you know this. Like I, I saw myself as good, hardworking, persistent, but not brilliant. Like I saw myself as like a Hermione, but not a Harry Potter. So <laughs> like, I, I mean, so when I got in, I was like, oh, okay, well, we'll see. Now, I started to wonder very carefully, why did I get in? Um, you see, there's a lot of conversations about affirmative action <laughs> around the time I got into Michigan. And as you, many of you know, this was like a hotbed for this issue uh, here in Michigan. And it was actually banned in 2012. So um, I hadn't quite navigated my feelings on affirmative action. I mean, I, I understood it theoretically, globally, but I haven't, I didn't quite I didn't quite have a grip on how do I think about affirmative action with me being a subject of a policy like me. Uh, it's, it, it, was a different, uh, it was really difficult to understand. Now, the main thing that I wanted to understand was what role did affirmative action or what role did my race and gender play in the admissions decisions? So I, I asked this question to pretty much a representative of every school that I got into. And obviously, people from Michigan answered the right way because I <laughs> ended up here. But there were some people did, that did not answer it the right way. So I, I kind of wanted to share some of the wrong ways. Um, for instance, um, there was one representative, actually a lot of them said, well, you got in because the merit mattered. The merit mattered, and it's the only thing that matters and it, it matters in the merit and the merit. <laughs> and that was it. And that was it. And it, 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 didn't really, it didn't really sit well with me at the time. Because I know diversity matters. I know my background. I'm, I'm bringing in something different. And they, they didn't even know how to have a conversation about diversity. So that kind of turned me off a little bit. Now, I, there's also one school that had in its admissions letter we have a lot of women on faculty. You'll feel welcome here. You'll have a lot of potential mentors come. And then when I visited, um, I didn't meet any women faculty. <laughs> so 
I mean, I, I get, I mean, I definitely understand now that people are busy. I definitely understand now. <laughs> but this, this shouldn't have been part of their recruitment letter. So if you, if you have, I don't know, they shouldn't have had it in their recruitment letter or they, or they should have followed up, one or the other, one or the other. That follow through was just, was lacking in the school. So um, I remember when uh, I found out that I got into Michigan, I thought, well, there's a black woman on faculty. I can ask her. So unfortunately, she's not in. Uh, Trishette Jackson, she's a professor in the math department. She is absolutely wonderful. And I, I remember, OK, I can have this honest conversation with her. So I remember asking her, all right, uh, Dr. Jackson, what role did my race and gender play in the admissions decision? I just braced myself. And she said, you know, yeah, the merit matter. And I thought, oh, you know, <laughs> not again. But then she followed up with, but we had this scholarship for you because the background that you bring or, or the diversity that you bring to the program matters. So I got reduced teaching the first two years. And I thought, this is like the perfect answer. I have the chops. I will fit in mathematically. I wasn't put in some separate pile when I was admitted, but they had extra funding for me to come because I was a diverse candidate. For me, this was, this was the perfect answer. Also, um, somebody else who played a major role in me coming to Michigan uh, was, was Karen. So I remember we were like studying together at, I forget, this, that guy's house, somebody's house. Ah, I forget. Anyway, so Karen called um, one evening, like shortly after I got the, uh, the like acceptance letter. And honestly, I didn't know who you were. <laughs> so I remember like, like Googling her when she was on the phone. She could probably hear me typing. And the one thing that she said that really stuck out was, if you come to Michigan, I'll look out for you. And she did. I mean, she really did. We became, <laughs> <laughs> we became friends. But just offering right up front, you come to Michigan, I will be your mentor. I mean, I couldn't have asked for more. So um, to make sure that I had a, a good start here in Ann Arbor, I wanted to start early because I'm type A, and I just need to start everything early. <laughs> so I wanted to move to Ann Arbor before the summer before first year. And fortunately, the university provided funding for this, which was very important. So I wanted to study for the algebra qual so I could skip the first year algebra sequence and take the second one. And I also wanted to at least get a head start on uh, this subject called topology because I hadn't seen topology in undergrad. I had no idea what it was. So I spent all summer studying for the algebra qual and, and learning a bit of topology. And this, this, this experience that summer, that was really crucial to ensuring that I would fit in mathematically, that I had the confidence to go into a study group and, and talk to people. I mean, that was, that was a really important experience. This experience also really came in handy when, um, OK, everybody goes through this. Your first year of grad school, you have kind of awkward conversations with people. I mean, there's a lot of insecurity in the first year, people like comparing themselves to, to the other people. And I, I had one of these um, kind of awkward interactions. So I was in a group, study group, uh, with a bunch of guys. And there was this one guy uh, in particular who asked every guy in the room how to do a problem except me. And it was kind of weird because like, afterwards we would have like beers together and hang out. We were friends. But he couldn't do math with me. And I'm thinking, like, this is, this is ridiculous. And he was algebra at that. And I thought, damn it, I'm good at algebra. <laughs> like, you know. And so um, one day, I, I pulled him aside away from the group because I didn't want him to get defensive. And I asked, hey, man, like, why can't you do work with me? And he said that he, his, in his undergraduate training, he didn't have any female professors. Um, he didn't have any women in like classmates. So he just didn't have any experience prior to grad school in interacting with women. And he, he was actually worried. <laughs> well, math-wise, OK. <laughs> uh, so he was actually worried. He, his, his words, his words. He was actually worried that if he had proved me wrong, that he would make me cry. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> 
mean, I don't cry about math. <laughs> I mean, so anyway, I just said, eh, don't worry about that. I mean, just, just try. Just try me. Just try. And I mean, after a few more inter awkward interactions, we were able to do math together. And by the time uh, we graduated, I mean, we were, we were talking math all the time. But having that support system right up jump, talking to Trichette, talking to Karen, having the summer here, that gave me the confidence to confront this guy and squash it quickly. A lot of times, women and people of color don't have that support system. So these issues sort of fester and slowly take that person down. Okay, so it's really important to have um, a proper number of role models in the, um, the program. So diversity is very, very important. Representation is very, very important for that reason. So from there, I started working with my thesis advisor uh, the summer after my first year. Um, his name is Toby Stafford. He was here until 2007, and he transferred over to the UK. And he's been a tremendously supportive throughout my career. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better research advisor. I mean, he was, he was perfect. He has incredibly high standards, um, which I respect. He's a professional with a capital P. He's knowledgeable, and I, I learned a lot from him. I was also very fortunate to spend a good chunk of my grad experience over in the UK working with them for like close to four years. I went back and forth to the UK. And Michigan was actually really, really flexible in letting me go back and forth. Like they didn't say, well, you got to pick. You're either there or here. I mean, it was, it was actually really, really nice. Now, did Toby and I talk about race and gender? Um, no, not, not really. And for me, that was actually on purpose. Now, I mean, everybody's different, but I wanted an advisor who I can talk about math with most of the time, like there was a line. Um, because I feel like talking about math and talking about race and gender sort of uses two different sides of the brain. I just, I needed to keep them separate <laughs> for a while. Um, but whenever race and, I mean, now we can talk about race and gender, of course. We could then, but now even more so. Um, but even now when it gets brought up for whatever reason, he always looks to me as the expert, which is really important. Sometimes I notice that um, in mathematics, if there's somebody who's good at math, they must be good at everything, <laughs> or they're the expert of everything. And there was never that with Toby. He's like, okay, you're the expert when it comes to, you're the expert at, at being you. And, and sometimes I, I, I see that people don't uh, recognize that. Just because you're good at math doesn't mean you're good at, good at everything, especially at being me. So <laughs> <laughs> overall, I mean, things in grad school went really well. I mean, I had a lot of support, again, um, in terms of recruitment and retention, the university fellowship, and meeting Trichette and talking on the phone with Karen was what got me here. And being able to go back and forth to the UK and the tremendous amount of mentoring I got here, including from older female graduate students at Michigan, is what kept me here, is what kept me here. Um, again, it wasn't all easy. I was single at the time. In Ann Arbor, <laughs> it's not a great place to single people. <laughs> so I was like a little lonely and stressed out. But then I, I learned how to salsa dance. And I made a lot of friends through that. And I don't want to get into that. But anyway, I <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, I, I got through, again, with a lot of support, a variety of support. All right, so um, after graduate school. Uh, so while I was applying for postdoctoral positions, I had a sneaking suspicion that there would be less of the type of support that I got in undergrad and in grad school. Why? Because I was at a different stage and I needed a different type of support. Also one that allowed me to be a mentor as well as a mentee. So um, I got hooked up with the EDGE program the Enhancing uh, Diversity in Graduate Education program. Actually, one of the founders was also um, a Marjorie Lee Brown speaker here a few years ago named Sylvia Bozeman. And this is a program uh, to help women transition from the undergraduate programs, respective undergraduate programs, to their uh, various PhD programs in mathematics. And usually about a third to half of the women in the program are of color. So I was actually admitted to the program when I was accepted to Michigan, but I wanted to start 
at Michigan early and sort of have my own edge program, if you will. But what I really missed in 2005 when I started here was the cohort because they keep in contact for like life. This is like a sorority. So this, I mean, it really is. They keep in contact for life. So what I did is um, I promised myself, if they would let me, to teach for the program uh, while I was a postdoc. And I did for four uh, consecutive summers. I taught a two-week class in advanced uh, linear algebra um, for four consecutive summers at four different places. Now, again, what I gained was a great network of mentors, mentees, and also the directors, Dr. Uh, Amy Rangiskaya and Yurika Wilson, were tremendously supportive. I mean, they pretty much gave me carte blanche to do whatever I wanted, which is kind of dangerous. <laughs> they didn't know me. <laughs> but um, again, they, they've been there for me uh, from my postdoc onward. So what was really cool about the program was I, I got to test out my mentoring style and my teaching style. From then, I only taught calculus. I never taught like a proofs course. So I had like these incredibly high standards, and I was pushing students to see how far they could go. And it was great, I mean, because I felt like everything was well-intentioned and it worked. So eventually, I uh, gained a great group of friends. Now, can you find me in that picture? It's not so easy <laughs> now <laughs> in this picture, but here I am. <laughs> the 2013 group, and uh, again, made nice with them. There's me salsa dancing with them <laughs> at, a, um, at a banquet. Okay, so this is a wonderful program. It's been running for uh, close to 20 years, and uh, with the new administration, I don't know if programs like this are gonna get much financial aid. So I have to put a plug in <laughs> for this foundation if, if I had a hat, I would pass it around <laughs> and collect money <laughs> for the program. But they really do need funding to keep going. Um, yeah, just <laughs> give me the coins, give me the coins. But it's called the, um, the uh, Sylvia Bozeman and Rhonda Hughes Edge Foundation. These are the two founders of the program from Spelman and from Bryn Mawr. And they're looking for funding or looking for instructors or looking for guest speakers. I mean, it, it really is a great great network of women in math. Okay, so the postdoc. Um, things turned out okay. I got an NSF postdoc um, and I was hosted at the University of Washington, Seattle for a year. And I also got a postdoc position at MIT, which um, was great. I mean, I was absolutely thrilled. All of this hard work was ah, it's paying off. Um, I've also must have had really good letters of recommendation in my file. And I, I, I ha should point out in this talk that letters of recommendation play a crucial role uh, throughout, I mean, anybody's uh, trajectory. So this is a nice poster from the University of Arizona that helps people pick out if they have some sort of implicit bias <laughs> going on when they write letters, particularly for women. Uh, Words to avoid in letters of recommendation. Caring, <laughs> compassionate, interpersonal, warm, helpful. I don't use those words. Words like insightful, resourceful, confident, ambitious, independent, intellectual. These are power words that I think sometimes um, get omitted for letters of recommendation for women. So this is one of my few resources in this talk. But obviously the letters worked out uh, well in my behalf. Okay, so now I can give an entirely different talk on how to start a postdoc, do's and don'ts, what to do and not to do. But in short, what I did was I tried to find common ground with my postdoc mentors and try to adjust my interest to what they do so that I can write papers with them. That way I learn more math, that way I get collaborators, et cetera. But this didn't start off so easy. Uh, particularly at MIT. This was the first time I really experienced <coughs> imposter syndrome. The, what in the hell am I doing here? <laughs> like, my Arden's down the hall, like, what am I doing? What am I doing here? Again, what did race and gender, like, how did they play a role in my admissions decision? I mean, this going on again. Um, and also, the if I mess up, I'm going to make other black folks look bad. 
type of deal. I mean, that's, that's crazy pressure. It's crazy pressure. And I was sort of doing the homework, I mean, throughout my stint there. I don't think there's been another black female or maybe even female of color more instructor, as far as I know. That's the, like, kind of the fancy postdoc there. I think I was the first one. So I really felt like I cannot mess up. <laughs> I cannot mess up. It's, it's, it was kind of a burden. So I, I, I was getting really anxious and really nervous, and I thought, I'm going to blow this. So I need to see a shrink. I'm just, I'm just trying to be, like, real <laughs> with y'all. I decided I needed to get some therapy, and, and no shame in that. I was in Boston, and I was working all the time, and uh, the salsa scene sucks there, so I wasn't dancing. <laughs> and I didn't have any friends, because all my potential friends weren't working all the time. And um, anyway, I called the shrink, and even then I had difficulty trying to coordinate my schedule with the shrink's schedule, and I thought, I'm even failing trying to get a shrink. I mean, this is ridiculous. <laughs> so I remember calling my sister, and she's like, you know, just go home to Detroit. Just fly home. Okay. And so I get home and I crash with my aunt. As I sit there, sat there on my aunt's couch eating pizza and watching home renovation shows <laughs> on like A&E or something, <laughs> I felt like, why am I this depressed? I, I need it. Um, why isn't this working out? I mean, why didn't anybody warn me about this? Like, and I thought about my supply of role models that I've accumulated and supply of mentors I accumulated so far. And I, I realized that um, nobody was, had experienced exactly what I was experiencing um, at MIT, a black female postdoc in MIT's math department. Um, I wouldn't say that their experience was more intense or less intense than mine. It's just different, just different. And like poof, 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 poof like that. I realized that I was in new territory. I couldn't really look to the past. And I needed to be my own role model. Like, I needed to just chart new territory. Um, I could get advice from people, but really, I had to find my own path. And it was scary, but I decided I needed to, to do something different, something radical. So upon arriving back to Boston, I decided that I would try to get a boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> like, like a partner. Like a, I mean, he could complain about work, and I could complain about work, and then it could be, in, it has to be in that order so I could complain more, and have more time. <laughs> I didn't want somebody in math. I didn't want, I didn't want a mathematician. I didn't, I mean, I didn't necessarily need somebody of color, but I definitely didn't want to teach like racism 101 lessons, or even 201. Um, so I joined Match, and I decided I'm going to go out on dates, and I went out on a date, and I got a little bit more than what I bargained for. I actually got a husband. <laughs> and like five weeks after we got well, engaged, what? okay, sorry, Dad. Um, <laughs> um, and then shortly after that, uh, we had uh, puppies. <laughs> puppies. <laughs> so... And each one of them, Matt, my husband, that's Mr. Mischief Maker, that's Dr. Thaddeus Arbuckle Boom Boom the Third. Um, they all <laughs> helped me be the very best me. And this is probably one of the smartest professional decisions I've made. Deciding I need to get my personal life together in order to get happy, 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 so I can do more work. <laughs> <laughs> so during my postdoc, I worked my butt off. Um, I, I, I made projects with my postdoc mentor as a priority so I could learn a lot more mathematics, so I could build more collaborations, so I could figure out what is my research program. And I figured, I sort of, I figured out what my research program was at the end of my postdoc, at the end. And that's, that's how I got here. That's how I got these collaboration arrows. Right, that was the journey. Now, um, so at this point, getting invited to conferences, international conferences even, and I have a great network of collaborators and everything's going swimmingly. Um, but at this point, I do need to talk about conferences and networking. 
uh, particularly for uh, women and, and people of color. Okay, so, uh, uh, let's get into it. I've been sexually harassed at conferences and by senior colleagues. I mean, one of these incidents ended with somebody who I thought would be my advocate saying, well, he's going through a divorce, don't mind him. Okay, and there's been a number of these incidents that I've handled in a variety of ways. Uh, I've had racist jokes told around me, like 1920s N-word jokes. Um, again, it got handled, but still, it's exhausting. And these events, clear uh, instances of sexism and racism have thrown me off, have eaten up an absurd amount of time and energy that I could have used to do work at these conferences. And instead, I have to seek out an ally and figure out what to say to them and check them and then think about it and blame me, but then blame them, but then blame me. Then it's exhausting. But what really took the cake for me was the following story. I was at one of these uh, fancy conference centers, and there was a guy at the conference who was really upset that nobody was quoting his work, and, and people in the math community would probably know one of these people at conferences that sort of blurts out, he's not citing me, he's not citing me, nobody cares about me, and he, I hope these people are in the room, but yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, this guy was just, eh. <laughs> and I, I, was, I was scheduled to give a talk at the end of the week, and I thought, oh, I hope he doesn't do that during my talk, because I don't react well to this. So anyway, we were in a common room together, and um, he starts, to, he points at me, and he's like, you, you know, nobody cites my work. And he just sort of picks me out, and I thought, oh, I got to talk to him. So slowly, like, one by one, people started to leave the room, and I sat by him. And I'm like, what's going on with you, man? You seem upset. Like, what's going on? Like, I mean, I'm trying to be his friend, you know. He's like, nobody's citing me. Nobody's citing me. And I let him rap for, like, ten minutes. And then finally I said, I mean, maybe you can, like, talk to the people, like, after the talk, because it might be more well-received instead of pointing it out during the talk. And he got so offended that I was trying to give him advice. He said, you know, I do have a PR problem, but I'm a very powerful mathematician. I mean, my techniques are amazing, grand, and all, and I'm, but I have a PR problem. And you have the opposite problem. You're an incredibly weak mathematician, and you've only gotten this far due to your connections. Now, anyone who knows me He's probably surprised that I didn't curse him out or hit him or karate chop him or, you know, <laughs> what, you know I mean, I, mean I, I played it cool and fortunately this happened at a point in my career where I was like at the end of my postdoc and had like all the stuff out and so I just, I was like, lies. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. It's not true and you know that. But if you need to say that to sleep well at night, you know, <laughs> Uh, it's just not true. Um, wrong. Wrong. <laughs> 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 wrong. But if I didn't have people in my corner to vent to in, during these incidents, um, if I didn't have people to validate my outreach, I don't know what I would have done. I mean, these types of incidents have happened to several friends of mine who didn't have that community of support. And, and some of them left mathematics because of it. I mean, if I didn't constantly have people in my corner to, who, recognized it, my, who recognized my progress and recognized my talent, such as my postdoc mentors, I don't, I don't know if I will be here talking about my journey up the academic ladder. I've had a lot of support a lot of support, and that's helped me get through these incidents. And these are only a few. Support, diversity, inclusion, and equity matter. People, people tend to stay where they feel welcomed, right? Um, now, I can, 
I mean, we could talk about recruitment and retention all day, but these efforts are rendered fruitless if you're trying to recruit and retain them in a toxic environment. So really, there's a third leg to that, I guess, puzzle. Recruitment, retention, and be nice. <laughs> and make, make the environment nice for others, okay? So that last incident with that, that, uh, that guy got me so annoyed, got me so annoyed that I kind of turned that energy into organizing uh, this, again, at the Banff International Research Center. Uh, this is a conference for women in non-commutative algebra and representation theory, um, where women will group up and do research projects together. Eleanor is in this picture. Where are you? Uh, you're on the left. There you are. And there's me, and there are the three other um, co-organizers. And this was great. A conference full of women doing research, and there were seven research groups, and I think three already have papers out. This, this, um, this conference happened in March. So this really worked. And there are my collaboration arrows. So I tried to take a negative a situation where I was just thoroughly insulted and said, you know what, I'm, I'll show you. <laughs> and I organized uh, this along with some collaborators. Now, um, but let's get real, if, as if we're not doing that already. Um, those three instances that I, I've, I've mentioned before, they all happened to my face, okay? But the vast majority of discrimination, uh, flat out bullying, and the ugliness of math culture happens behind closed doors. Uh, in admissions decisions, uh, in hiring decisions, in promotion decisions, in letters of recommendation, uh, behind referee reports, we've all gotten those nice ones, uh, in grant panels, et cetera, et cetera. This happens to everyone, not just marginalized people, but it does happen to marginalized people at a disproportionate rate. Uh, when anonymous, cowards strut their stuff. So, I have to ask, since there are a lot of faculty here, if you aren't doing this already, if you witness or hear about any of this nonsense, either in person or anonymously, uh, let's do something about this. Now, as many of us know, there's no single judge and jury in mathematics. There's no like gavel, hammer down. I mean, it's really pure lead. So um, a lot of stuff kind of gets let go. So I, I, I uh, in, a, in an attempt to be solution oriented, I, I want to suggest that we have like some sort of yellow card, red card system, if you will. <laughs> I don't know. This is just to help get the conversation started or continued. So I, the way I see it, the more power you have, the more you can do. And by do, I mean like really you just stick it to these people. So if you don't have a lot of power, then I guess the best you can do is report this incident, whatever happened to you, to a person of authority. Um, if you witness some sort of public harassment, this warrants a public response, I think. Say something. So I don't see that. I mean, I see a lot of people feeling uncomfortable a lot of times that in, when these things happen. And I, I keep thinking, like, Jesus, it have to be me again? <laughs> like, I wish more people spoke up. And also, of course, warn, I mean, everybody does this, warning PhD students and postdocs and potential collaborators away from these toxic people. But here's something that's a little, okay, this may be unconventional. I'm sure not everybody agrees, but why? Let's just talk about it. Point out bias and unprofessionalism um, and request revisions of letters of recommendation, uh, referee reports, and grant reviews. Okay, so of course that person might not comply, so what happens then? If not, let's say that they're, I don't know, being really uh, ridiculous during a grant review. Just uninvite that person from the panel or throw out that review, right? I mean, I think that's kind of an easy fix. Or if they're being a bully at conferences, don't, don't invite that person to conferences anymore. <laughs> it's just, like, just, why bring that person back? Now, this is something that is a little tougher. What if somebody is a multiple offender of writing really horrible referee reports? Of course, you know, you might say, well, okay, ask, don't ask that person to write referee reports again. 
I don't think that person will see that as a bad thing because he wants to write these things. I mean, they might be like, yeah, I'm the winner, you know. <laughs> no more for me. Uh, I suggest we do the following. There should be some sort of coalition of, let's say, the top 20 journals in a particular field that keeps track of multiple offenders, right? You offend once, you get a yellow card. Do this multiple times, you get a red card, and you get banned from submitting papers to that collection of journals. I know this is radical, but it's, it's, it's somewhat of a solution. Anyway, this is just the, let's start with the conversation <laughs> on this stuff. Now, um, <laughs> you might be thinking, what if the culprit is a leader in my field? I don't want to risk the repercussions. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to risk the repercussions. But the repercussions are already here. That person is blocking others from entering the field. And the field would suffer because of it, less people will be working on that particular aspect of research. And there are some good, talented people leaving particular types of problems, fields altogether, mathematics altogether, because of these, well, bullies. Because of these bullies. And again, all of those wonderful recruitment and retention efforts are going to be rendered fruitless. So there has to be that third leg of the story. Let's be nice. <laughs> there needs to be a change in math culture. When there's more diversity, the level of comprehension goes up. When I'm put in a situation where I'm talking to people not like myself, which is like all the time, <laughs> I really work hard to try to connect with those people. But when you're, you're talking to people who are like yourselves, you, you use shorthand, you, I don't know, drop words. It's, level of, of clarity goes down. So when there's more diversity, there's more clarity, and the mathematics is actually better. That's, the, that's a real concrete benefit of having more diversity and mathematics. So um, I just want to end with uh, a few points. Uh, what is enough diversity? What is, what is that? How do you even measure that? I, I think there's enough of diversity in a particular setting when anybody could come into that setting and not feel like they need to do the count. Because i that's me all the time. I walk into a conference and I'm like, one, two, three, four, five, five women. <laughs> like it's like automatic. There's enough diversity when anybody can walk into a setting and not feel the urge to do the count. And we got a long way to go, but I'm hopeful that we'll make progress to getting there. Um, so if you're a student in the audience, how many students are here? Lots. Oh my God. Students, students, <laughs> students of color, women, students, the LBGTQ community, disabled community. Um, what, do you, what should you think of all this? Um, what's your role? What's your activism? In my opinion, your only activism is to graduate. That's it. <laughs> that is it. If you up that number by one, that's activism. <laughs> and be selfish with your time and don't feel guilty to do it because the better, the more time you spend on yourselves, the more power you get to do good later. So your only activism, in my opinion, is to graduate with a damn good thesis. That's, that's just my opinion. Um, in the meantime, folks of color, women, members of the LBGTQ community, disabled community, um, Find your people, find your support network and nurture it. Uh, don't just take from it, give to it. Don't just give from it, take from it. It's, it's a two-way street. And remember that racial fatigue, uh, gender fatigue, all these other types of fatigue from discrimination is very real. So cut yourself a break and do what you got to do to get back to work recharged. And lastly, um, and this is for everybody <laughs> uh, to end, I would like to ask everybody in the math community to try to do math with somebody not like yourself. Like, I did try, try. A person from a different country, um, a different gender, a different race, whether it's chatting math over a meal or, or writing a paper with them. Yeah, even like write a paper with them, try. I have no expectations. Treat that person like any other grad student, postdoc, tenure track, whatever they are. Just try to do math with somebody um, different than you. And let's hold ourselves accountable 
and this respect. Do the count of the number of women grad students we've had. Do the count of the number of collaborators from different countries we've had. I mean, do the count and the number of women speakers we had in the seminars that we're organizing and the conferences that we're organizing. I mean, th this matters. Um, I mean, did you invite them to come? Did you invite them to speak? Uh, will you ask them to co-organize? Will you write a letter of recommendation for them? This matters. And it, these small efforts make a big, big, big difference over time. Let's not be like Trump, okay? Let's push forward. I'm so optimistic about the future of mathematics because math is driven by the desire to discover and communicate new truths. And a welcoming, inclusive, creative, brilliant environment is the future of math that we want. This much I know to be true. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. I worked really hard on it. <laughs>